Brisbane store. Uh, today we're going to do a little live video with Adreno's Wayne Judge about dive safety. Wayne, tell us a bit about yourself. My uh, history in spearfishing and freediving has been maybe a lot less than some of my peers, but I've done 22 years spearfishing and freediving. Uh, started off in uh, Sydney. Very quickly I became president of the North Shore Underwater Club, so I sort of ended up finding the ropes of the, the whole club scene. And that was a very good beginning. And not long after I finished that, after a few years, I, uh, my son and I, Ant Judge and I, uh, started up Sydney Freedivers. And we had that going, still going now of course, it's a very strong freediving club, and mainly because he was really good at freediving, and I had to make the choice whether I was gonna do it or not. And it was very beneficial. What a great cross sport to do for someone who's spearfishing. And uh, since then I've become a freediving instructor. I've done first aid course, oxygen administration courses. I'm an uh, AIDA judge, that's a judge for freediving competitions. And, uh, and I'm a pretty successful coach as far as coaching other athletes as well. You've coached a few uh, champions, I'm, yeah, I'm, I've got, I'm told. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got uh, four Australian records and a couple of Iranian red records under my belt. You know? wow. And of course, it's the athletes who do the work, and, and I'm just helping them to achieve the best they can. You know? And that's what a coach's job is. Yeah, awesome. So, more than qualified to talk about this topic today of dive safety. Um, to kick it off, can you tell us a bit about what a shallow water blackout is? It's a blackout, and a blackout is loss of consciousness due to low oxygen. Simple as hell. It's really not complicated. The only reason it's called shallow water blackout is because it happens most often in the shallow water when a person is coming up from more depth. And at the point from the top 10 meters, the air in the lungs doubles in size. And because of that doubling in size, it creates a, uh, a, a shortage of oxygen. Very technical and a lot of people don't really understand it today because it's hard to put all uh, attachments to the body and send them down there. But that shortage of oxygen will black a person out in that top 10 meters. So you lose consciousness basically? Yeah, you come up and you know, uh, out of the blue, and it's, it's not actually on the way up quite often. And I would say more than half the time the person actually gets to the surface then blacks out. Wow. And once they're blacked out, it doesn't matter that they're on the surface, the body will kick in and start to breathe at some stage, and at that point, the diver drowns. Because they're underwater. Yeah, their yeah. face is underwater. They yeah. could have their back above and their face underwater, yeah. still drown. Yeah. Because there's no, no consciousness, nothing, not enough to say, lift my head out of the water. It's gone. You're gone. The person comes around and they go, what happened? You might be holding them up, and they go, whoa, what happened? What's happening? You know, why are you holding me? Where's my mask? You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, what would you say is the, I guess, the period in a diver's progression where they're most susceptible to suffering um, a shallow water blackout? It's a good question, and I did a study on this because as president of uh, North Shore Underwater Club uh, many years ago, uh, we had a lot of young people get in there, and they got to the point where they got very good, and I started noticing that they were doing some crazy things. They were timing themselves and bragging about how long they were down and how short their recoveries are and various other things. And uh, so I thought I'd better check what's going on. And, and at that point we had about nine or ten blankets in a period of about two years. It was quite bad. And just about first, every one of them could have been handled if there was a person watching the person at the end of the dive. That was the, that was the thing that was noticeable. But the second thing was the majority of them were intermediate divers. They were no longer the new diver. They got to the point where they were getting good fish and they were diving deep and being very confident. And they were getting praise for this. And at that point, a person can get that feeling of being immortal and uh, they don't know where that cutoff point is. Whereas once they get through years of diving and they've had their good days and their bad days, well, all of a sudden they, have got, they know when they need to come up. It's no longer a, uh, a uh, you know, I can stay down or I'm going to get that snapper or whatever it is, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's that aggressive intermediate diver that was the most aggressive. They're pushing themselves to that next level. Yeah. Yeah, just and pushing themselves. And they learn how to cheat the breath, you know. They, when you first start, there's nothing like that urge to breathe. You will panic <laughs> and go Whoa! up to the surface, you know. But after a while, you learn to cheat it. 
you learn to stay down there with contractions and, and things like that. Well, at that point, before you know where your cutoff point is, that's the dangerous point. Mm. That's where we lose people. And would you say that, I mean, experienced divers, can, can they still suffer from shallow water blackout? Yeah, well, the hard part about it is, is nobody uh, is immune to this. And we've had the greatest woman freediver in history blackout last year. Uh, just diving, we don't know what happened, but she just died and drowned and we never saw her again. And she was an amazing diver. Mm. So there are plenty of examples of expert divers coming to grief as well. So really the bottom line is we have to go back to the very basic and the basic is don't dive alone. Mm. And that doesn't mean don't enter the water and go off your own way. That means go in the water and look after each other mm. to the point where you are responsible for that person getting up to the surface mm. in every dive. And I know just a couple of weeks ago, a triple world spearfishing champion who he was diving you know, without a buddy and, and he unfortunately passed away from shallow water blackout. So yeah, I guess no matter your experience level, whether you're a champion or just going from beginner to intermediate, you're really susceptible to it. You are susceptible, yeah. you know. So I guess on that topic of not diving with a buddy, how do you how do you be a good buddy diver? What does it what does it mean to dive with a buddy? It's a good question. I think it comes down to the real basic on it is what is the purpose of the buddy? Is it yeah. to just sort of say, hey, a great fish or you know, good dive or something like that? Or are you responsible for your buddy? And the bottom line is if you're responsible for your buddy to get to the surface, you will watch the dive and right till he's at the surface and a few seconds afterwards to make sure he doesn't black out upon surfacing, you know. And that's the thing, it's the purpose of the buddy. So that means while he's down there and a fish swims up to you, you don't go off and spear it. You have to really be disciplined on that and that's really what it's about, knowing that if he comes to grief, it'll be on your shoulders. Of course it's on his shoulders as well because he mm. is the person who does the stupid act, mm. you know, of going too far. But uh, bottom line is the buddy's responsibility is for his buddy and yeah. you've got to do that back and forth as the day goes through. Yeah. And um, I guess on that note as well of, of who's responsible for it, if I'm going diving, what are some things that I can do so that I'm protecting myself from blacking out as well, I guess in terms of my breathe up and, and all of those things? Well, probably the, the first thing to do is never hyperventilate. Hyperventilate definition of hyperventilate is taking on more oxygen, more breath than your body needs at that moment. So if you're doing what we're doing here, you do a couple of deep breaths. You don't need to do that to actually carry on here. So you've just moved into the realms of hyperventilation. The top free divers in the world will come up, tidal breathe, they won't take three or four big breaths, They'll just go down and do their performance, take one breath and die. Mm. Why? Because they actually can go further. And it's a scientific uh, a fact on that. Mm. And so the bottom line is it's not so comfortable though. And that's what hyperventilation does. It gives you a more comfortable dive, but more risky. Mm. And that's really where it's at. As soon as you're hyperventilating, you're getting rid of carbon dioxide. Your oxygen will come to 100%. Uh, probably within three or four breaths at the most. We're all sitting about 94%, 95, sometimes more. Three or four breaths at the most. Maybe some people, I mean, some people with big lungs, one breath and he will be completely 100% oxygen saturated. Mm. So anything after that is getting rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the trigger. That's the trigger that tells you when to breathe. So you might have this lovely, comfortable dive because you've hyperventilated. If you get that trigger too late, and you uh, might be coming up going, yeah, I'm going to the surface now, and you're just starting to feel the urge, well, you might be 20 meters away from the surface, and that's enough for you to black out before you get there. Mm. So if you, hyper, if you don't hyperventilate, you will get stronger urges to breathe, and this is what we need to tell us to get back to the surface. Yeah, it's your body's safety mechanism. Exactly, and that's probably the major thing, is don't hyperventilate. Mm. Can you, I don't know if you can, but is, is there an, a demonstration you can give us of breathing yourself that would show this is perhaps a little bit what hyperventilation looks like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm sitting here standing talking, I'm not using anything, I'm, this is usual. So for me, hyperventilation,
I didn't need that. That's mm -hmm. the beginning of hyperventilation. Now, that's not dangerous, but if I were to do five or six of those, the amount of carbon dioxide I'm jettisoning will make me into a, a, an unsafe diver. Okay. I won't get that signal. Yeah, so being a little bit over the top. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of things that some divers do to help them prepare for spearfishing. One of them is diving in the pool. If I can swim 50 metres in a pool, would you say I can dive to 25 metres depth and, and come back up pretty easily? No, not at all, actually. The difference is depth. More than difference than just depth, because you're now dealing with currents, waves, uh, structure below, you've got so many things to attract your attention that could burn more oxygen. Mm. You know, could be as simple as you're getting a slap in the face by the wave or water in the snorkel just before you go down or something like that. So you don't get that in the pool. The pool is so controlled. You know, you can, and if you, if you don't, uh, you know, uh, not comfortable or going, or you, you can come back and go back and try it again, you know, but there might be a fish down there and you don't get a second chance of them. So you've really got to be conservative when you go into, a, uh, into the ocean. Mm. And uh, the pool is a good thing for building uh, your abilities, but not for comparison. Mm. And are there um, any, I guess, pool drills or... I, I know you think you've got a, a drill workshop coming up soon. Tell, tell us a little bit about that, and we're going to be filming that live at the end of this month on May 24 at um at the Somerville House Pool in Brisbane. But yeah, I guess tell us tell us a little bit about that event and what you'll be doing. Yeah, we've got a situation where spearfishers want to train. They want to be able to get more downtime and and uh, go further safely, and uh, so. To help that, I'm getting a squad going. It's not just for free, uh, spare fishers, it's for free divers generally, but it is a squad and we will be in the first few weeks, because I've got a coral sea trip coming up, <laughs> concentrating on what drills are needed to be done by spare fishers that increase their abilities. And there are definite drills, and it's not rocket science, it's just working out what are our requirements, you know, mm. and working your drills around there. Mm. And then the good thing about it is when we get the pool with a bunch of divers, we start making them be responsible for each other right then and there. So mm -hmm. each one gets a partner to work with. And, you know, we do a, a few role-playing drills where somewhere in this lap, someone's going to have a blackout on that partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it makes the guy always being aware, looking for the signs and mm -hmm. things like that. And that just brings the, uh, the person's abilities to be a safe driver up so far. Okay. And I'll, I'll finish on this question. What... Um, what I guess educational avenues are out there for spearfishers to take in terms of courses and, and things like that to help improve their diving and their safety. The first thing really is a, get a free diving course done. You know, a lot of spearfishers know a fair bit anyway because they've been studying it for a while. But a free diving course to get past, you've got to drill your recoveries. You've got to be able to dive down certain depth and pick people up. You know, uh, it's quite interesting if you dive down. 15 or 20 metres to save someone. 20 metres is a long way to bring someone up. You don't realise how far it is until you do it. What if you had to do two of those, you know, in, in short succession? So a uh, free diving course is a, a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. you know? And get through them. The first one, it's a real basic thing, you know, and you just get your basic. But when you get up to the, the uh, second and the third one, well, now you're learning to dive some good depths and you're starting to find the safety that you need at those depths. Mm. And that's the most important thing, I guess, is to go out and have a good time, get some fish and come home at the end of the day all safely. <laughs> that's right. No tragedies, everybody's happy, everyone's eating fish. And yeah. No exactly. fish is worth your life, eh? Yeah, that's exactly All right, well, thank you so much for your time, Wayne. My and um, we'll uh, touch base with you later in the month at your spearfishing drills workshop and do some live filming with you there. Great. Excellent. Yeah.